code. Yeah. All right. Hello, Wyoming. Uh, it is my joy and pleasure to get to do this grant project with you all. My name is Carmen Bowman. I applied for a grant in your state and they were very willing to work on culture change over three years. And we're doing several things, one of which is free education. Uh, Ta-da, today. And thank you all for joining. We all know there's lots of things competing for your time. And so I hope to make it worth every second of your time. And I just wanna say thank you to the Wyoming State Survey Agency and your region of CMS for approving this grant. It's called Implementing Culture Change Throughout Wyoming, Affecting Resident-Directed Living and Team Member Retention. And look at that, here we are, we made it through a pandemic and so many of your homes are dealing with retention issues. And I just wanna tell you all in general, changing institutional culture translates into staff retention and recruitment. And we are going to create webinars um, more closely associated to that topic. Uh, but this webinar is technically our webinar four. And this was just in the works. It's, it's always a good topic to start with, with a culture change endeavor, and that is language. So language drives practice. There is a, there is a saying that <laughs> right there, language drives practice. If you change language, typically practice follows. So if we create a more dignified, normal language, guess what? You're gonna create a more even dignified and normal culture. I, I find it fascinating, the power of language. And so that's also what I've called it, um, the power of language to create culture. If you keep using institutional words, guess what kind of culture you, we create? And if you use normal, natural, not institutional words, guess what kind of culture you create? So. There's a lot of power in words. And then I also was very fortunate to write a paper about this with two very smart people who've studied language themselves. So if you're interested, I have it at the end as a free resource, but today we'll just quickly look at some research, why words matter. We're gonna borrow from another field. And then of course, we're gonna look at long-term care. So why do words matter? There was a study of older people um, and they were asked to read an article <laughs> about how age impairs your memory. And then they were given a memory test. So how do you think they did compared to the other group who read a different article that said age has nothing to do with memory? <laughs> who do you suppose had better scores? Isn't that interesting? So look at the power of words. Um, also, the, um, let's see. Also, you know, the, the opposite, more positive articles that um, memory is, is, I guess, I don't know the study by heart, but there were also other positive articles about memory and aging. And again, those people had improved memory scores. So here's a conclusion. The more aware that people are, all of us, of the aging stereotype, the worse they performed. So look at the power of language there. Here's another study. So there were two groups of young people and one group just heard random words that, had to, that were positive regarding aging, such as the words wise and alert and sage and learned. And then another group, the negative words like decline and senile and decrepit and dementia and confused. And so after they read some and saw some words, <laughs> um, guess who uh, had a better memory performance and a worse memory performance. So there it is again. And then another interesting outcome of this study was that the researchers noted that the group that heard the negative words about aging walked out slower when they left the building than, the wor than those who heard the positive words about aging. And when they spoke to the participants about that, the participants basically disagreed. Like they felt like, no, those words had no impact on how fast I walk. <laughs> so I'm amazed by that. And uh, there's like three studies right there that prove the power of words. Plus we all just know it, right? And so the power of language. So I wanna ask all of you to interact with me here. I know it's tricky over webinars, but uh, we know it's fun to could you tell me in the chat box quickly what you're thinking of when you see that word right there, right now? Aged, what comes to mind? Just do a quick 
what came popped into your mind first? Uh, what do they call that word association, right? I'd love to hear from a few of you. Here it, here it comes. Hi, Brenda Hancock. Uh, <laughs> Brenda thinks of cheese. Nicole thinks old. Pam thinks dying. Thank you. Just whatever comes to your mind first, guys. Don't judge it. Let's just see what pops in your mind. Retirement, wrinkles, and furniture. <laughs> That's good. April, a lot of people go antiquing, right? For furniture, aged furniture. Uh, car, I don't know who that is, but you're saying wine. Yep. Chelsea thinks of dusty. <laughs> oh, that is great. Thank you, everyone. So the point here is um, that we think of different things with different words. It's called association. And looky there, you thought of them all plus more. I'm going to add furniture and dusty. I love that to the list. So look at that. There's proof that words have different associations. Okay. And Sometimes we say a word and we don't exactly know exactly what someone's meaning by it. So just a little bit of like theory here from um, linguistics. Words frame our experiences, right? So if you worked in a cheese factory, <laughs> if you grew up in it, your parents ran it, right? The word aged probably is going to bring cheese to your mind quicker than anything else, right? And then words also carry two different meanings, the definition out of the dictionary, but also then the associations that we're talking about here. Therefore, the same word can evoke different associations also in different contexts, same, same idea. Words create expectations of meaning as well. This is something a little different here now. Um, and names or labels also create what is called response tendencies and also something that is called listener bias. So what we call it is how we'll treat it. And before I go on, I'd love for you to think about, are there names or labels that create a tendency in us to now have a bias about that person? And it can be either in our field or outside our field. Try to, someone try to answer that. Are there names or labels that create a, a response tendency? You tend to think a certain way when you hear that name or label and maybe even a bias, good or bad, you know, doesn't matter. Can anyone think of one? I'm not seeing any. So, oh good, here comes. Who is gonna help me? Natalie, demented, yes. Ah, Pam, liberal or conservative, good. Uh, how about special needs, everybody? How about confused, right? Very good. Uh, slow, yes, good. So you get the idea. Um, in our work, we have confused, we have, you know, we don't often hear the term demented so much anymore, but the same idea, right? Confused. Um, the Alzheimer's resident, you don't need to say that, everybody. The Alzheimer's patient, see? Confused. How about, uh, this is a sad one. I actually saw a nursing home administrator do this more than once, I'm sorry to report. And she would speak of, well, I have a little resident that does da da da. And then it even also was used with CNAs. I have a little CNA <laughs> and you know, I think it makes the point, doesn't it? Why are you calling someone little? Perhaps you don't mean harm. And then how do you treat someone when you think of them as a little, a little resident or a little CNA? And I'd love to know what you guys think about that. And then here's another interesting word, everyone. My, this is not true, but let's say my, my great uncle is 94 and he still drives. Can you believe it? And now the word still becomes ageist. This has been taught to us by Dr. Bill Thomas. Many of you know him from the Eden Alternative. What does it imply when we say he still drives? Can you believe it? Someone tell me. And April is helping here that the term little implies weak. Little, yes, thank you. And what does still imply, everybody? He still drives, right? Like we're, it's ageist because we're assuming that when you're 94, maybe you shouldn't be able to drive, right? So we are contributing to this plight of age, ageism and ageist language. And I'd love for you, I'm inviting you today to challenge yourself. So we're also gonna learn from other fields. Here's some examples. You know, correctional centers used to be called something else, prisons. <laughs> um, flight attendants used to be called something else, stewardesses and stewards, right? There's others. 
Um, but a closer field to us is the field of disability. And they are the ones to be credited to have invented something that we call person first language. And I would love to invite you all the rest of your life, the rest of your career to try to think of person first language. How would this, how would I say this if I used person first language? It's like the answer, okay? So we learn from this field that people, even with any sort of diagnosis, right? Any of us, we all have a diagnosis of something, right? We are people first. So we always put the person before the disability and we describe what people have. We don't, we don't use it to describe who the person is. So sadly, paraplegic becomes almost like using the diagnosis to explain who this person is. We don't have to do that. Believe it or not, diabetic is one of them as well. We, we, we use diabetic pretty, pretty frequently, I think, pretty commonly. It doesn't sound wrong, but guess what, everyone? It does this very thing. It throws the person into the diagnosis. It kind of makes the person the diagnosis. We don't mean to do that. And so if we did person first language instead, it would be, here's so-and-so, who has diabetes, see, person first, I just love it. So sadly, that's a label that we're all using, we've all done it. Another, someone points this out, why don't we use myopic then? We say, I wear glasses, why don't we say, I'm myopic? <laughs> I think that's a funny one. And it's a great example, we don't say that, we, we explain it. So part of better language, everyone, is just to explain more factually, describe what's happening, okay? And so that's a great example of someone who wears glasses. So instead of blind, it's someone like the person who is visually challenged. That's how they say it now. Uh, someone who has paraplegia. And then look at this wonderful, I don't even want to call it a cartoon, like it's better than a cartoon, right? It says, so what do you prefer to be called? Handicapped, disabled, or physically challenged? Uh, Joe would be fine. Oh, it makes such a good point, right? And this too is a wonderful line. The most appropriate label is usually the one people's parents have given them. So I want you to just take that as a gift if you haven't thought about that. Um, the only label anyone ever needs actually is their name. Wouldn't that be cool if we got rid of all other labels and we called people by their name and then we discussed whatever it is that needs to be discussed. You know, how's your diabetes today, right? Because you are not a diabetic. No, you are Joe and you're important and we care for you and you, there's lots of things about you, one of which is that you have diabetes. In fact, that's how a leader in the field of person first language taught it to me that, you know, her son had special needs and that's where she uh, glommed onto this idea that my boy is more than, than special needs. So she would explain it. This is my son, let's say Kevin, and here's a lot of things about him right? He loves to draw and he loves to this and that. Oh, and he also has cerebral palsy. I really appreciated that. We are people first. There's lots of things about us. Don't you think that the diagnoses, the medical diagnoses should come last, right? Or the fact that I'm incontinent should come last. Think about care plans, everyone. A lot of care plans, you, it might be fun to just go look. I, I dare you. Go open one care plan and look at the very first page. What is the very first thing you learn about the person? And I sure hope it's not that they're incontinent. And, and to be honest, what, what a culture change practice would be is you make darn sure that the first thing anyone comes to is who this person is. And notice the power of the care plan, even the order of the care plan. And don't just call it a social history, everyone. That too is... is um, I'm looking for a word, it's not helping us. And here's why, uh, we need more about people. We need to know who they are, right? And a new language um, is life history versus social history. But anyway, we're gonna move into our field now of long-term care. And there is something in the culture change movement we, we refer to as institution speak. And you're gonna hear a lot of it right now. Um, and these are things that, that maybe all of you have learned to say, I've learned to say it. And guess what? We don't have to, that's the best part. And you get to choose what you're gonna say and what you're not. And you see, poor language has made such a impact that it even is in federal regs. I don't know if you know that, but at tag 550 under resident rights, where 
people are to be treated with respect and dignity. It actually says avoiding the use of labels such as feeders and walkers. And so I'm gonna talk about those too, but while I do, I'd like for you to tell me what are some other labels you've ever heard? Let's try to call them all out, labels, 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 okay? And I'll chat about feeder <laughs> and I'd love for you to answer this too. What is really a feeder? And someone could look it up in your phone. What is a feeder? What comes up? What have you ever heard? What does your brain go to with feeder? And, you know, just for the sake of time, I'll tell you what people have said, bird feeder, bottom, bottom fish feeder, um, a trough is sometimes called a feeder. And then really, I think the main one is on the radio in farm country. Have you ever heard how the feeders went for so much money today? And usually it's the calves and the pigs the young calves and pigs that have been fattened for market and they are called feeders. Let's pause for a minute. And who thought it was a good idea to refer to people as feeders, right? It is weird in this business, everyone, how we have labeled so many things, particularly people. I don't totally understand it. We never needed to, and I don't know why we did. And so, I invite you today, I'm sure none of you say it anymore, but if, if it's in your community, I invite you today to invite your team to never say that word again. And then you just describe, here's a funny story. So, you know, two decades ago, I thought, well, what's a better, what's a better word? And see, I came up with, oh, I know, dignified diner. Don't you like that, everyone? It's good, right? And someone said, no, Carmen, we don't need a title. It's still a label and they're right. So you would just describe that this is Mary and she needs assistance eating. Um, I try to even avoid saying she needs to be fed. Now that might be too specific for some of you, I get it. Like literally that probably is what we have to say if someone does need to be fed. But when we're talking about someone needing to be fed, who are we usually talking about? And that is babies. So with adults personally, I just try to as long as I can refer to the fact that they do need help eating or assistance with eating. And probably you and I know if we work together, I'm really saying she needs to be fed, but that, that's a pretty parse, that's parsing things. Um, and have any of you heard of any other labels? Nobody? Please, there's lots of them. There's screamer, there's wetter, the isolator, hoarder, wanderer, oh, the frequent faller. And then they call the frequent fallers who are frequently falling repeat offenders. Have you heard it? How about complainer? Oh, she's a complainer. So let's just pause for a minute, everyone. I'm inviting you to, to never label anyone again. If someone is screaming, you talk about, oh my gosh, let's figure out what's going on with this person. She's screaming a lot. That's not so good. Something's wrong, right? Let's never label someone a wetter. We have a lot of people that need help with incontinence. That's why they live in nursing homes. Did you know? <laughs> That's the number one reason. Um, the isolator, really, is it a loner who's always liked to be that way? It, look at the judgment. Maybe someone likes to be alone. There should be no judgment. The hoarder, I invite you to stop using that language. If people do hoard things, there's usually a reason, and it's your privilege to figure it out with them and help them and get to the bottom of things. And maybe you can serve them and provide for them so they don't have to hoard. Um, wandering is the weirdest word ever. And sadly, I, maybe we didn't even mean for it to be negative, but it's become negative. So just try to describe it. Do you feel like this person really needs to walk or do you feel like they're bored or are they looking for home? Do they need to get out of the locked environment? Would you need to get out? I would. So just try to stop labeling and instead explain it. Um, here's, here's the people who are falling quite a bit lately. Here's two residents who have fallen twice this month. And then everybody, <laughs> the people who complain, if I was you, I would thank them. You know why? They are revealing to you where your weak, weak spots are and you wanna know. Did you realize that's what Quapi is all about? You know, having been a surveyor, I learned that quality assurance and performance improvement is a gift from the government. They're asking you to find out where your weaknesses lie and you to fix them. And if even during survey, uh, you can show a survey team, yes, we know about that weak area and yes, we're working on it through our QAPI, they won't cite it. 
I have a great story that we didn't cite it. It's so good. And then you don't want to label them negatively that they're a complainer, right? Instead, they're like, wow, a helper. <laughs> you know how you could just flip how you see it. You want people to speak up. Don't be afraid to speak up. Usually people are afraid to speak up, right? And then again, just try to describe what's happening. So we have the quad, the Alzheimer's, the CVA. Sometimes labels become those diagnoses. We just don't need to do that. Hopefully you don't hear this anymore. I don't know, I'd be curious. But you know, when we have had the lists that say, wake these people up or put these people down, <laughs> you know, it, it became the put down list and the get up list. And then it kind of morphed into the put downs and the get ups. Which one would you be? And would you be proud? Isn't that weird? Another weird way that we labeled people. Just, I would just avoid it, period. Then we have, um, I don't know why we do this. Oh, the Alzheimer's residents and the Alzheimer, we have an Alzheimer's patient, blah, blah, blah. So again, it's labeling, it's clumping the person into the diagnosis. We do not need to do that. Please don't do that. You know, people live in this neighborhood who live with dementia or live with Alzheimer's. And we'll come back to patient in a minute. And certainly let's avoid calling people by their room numbers or their bed letter. And isn't it interesting, the term memory care, <laughs> I do believe it's a violation of HIPAA. How about you? Because what are we giving away to the rest of the world? I find that interesting. So the word patient, everyone, where are you if you are a patient? And I'm sure you know what I mean. Usually we're in the hospital or I am a patient to my physician, right? And see, in 1987, the Nursing Home Reform Act, it's a big deal, over 87, if you've heard of it. Uh, one thing they made sure to do is to change, to not use patient and instead to use resident. That's where that came from. And those guys are proud of that language change because the word resident shows that you live there. The, the term patient, everyone, basically means that things are being done to you. It's almost like a powerless place in a way. Um, and even though hospitals right now focus a lot on patient-centered care, patient-centered care. It was actually in Wyoming a few years ago, no offense to the speaker, but her whole topic was patient-centered care. And she came from the hospital setting. And for an hour, I kept hearing the patients, the patients, the patient-centered care. And guess what I realized, everybody? I don't, I, I don't think it's the right language. We're still missing something. So if someone could answer, what are we missing when all we talk about is patient-centered care? And I'll wait and come back to that in a minute. Another neat word that people are using, everyone, is the word neighbor. So the people who live in the nursing home where you work, are they neighbors to one another? Yes. And, and I didn't invent it. I think it's interesting. They are neighbors to one another. But are they neighbors to us? Not so much, but we don't live there. So it doesn't matter. They are neighbors to one another. And some communities have decided to refer to the people who live there as neighbors and not residents. And guess what? This is taking off in Wyoming. Uh, we, have, um, we have South Lincoln on the line. They are one of the five homes in the first year project for more intense culture change training. And they've glommed onto this and they are doing it. And I'd love to hear from you guys how that's going. Uh, and the Wyoming Culture Change Steering Committee also decided to use it. So forgive me, I'm not 100% I'm not on it, uh, saying it yet, and I need to work on that. And so if you hear neighbor, it's probably referring to the people who live there. And you could talk about that as a community, consider it. Some, some, some um, cultures also use the word elder, and it's only meant in the deepest of respect. And if you do, good for you. And if you want to, do it. There's nothing wrong with it. And make sure you chat about it, because we've also run into older people who say, please don't call me an elder, <laughs> you know? And then you have younger people that live there, so it gets a little confusing, right? And I'm not telling anyone what to do. If you love the term elder, many do, do it. Uh, the other option would be just to refer to the people who live here. No one gets, seems to get offended by the word people or person. And another wonderful word I would suggest trying is individual. Because every time you say the word individual, you just said a lot, actually. You know, we're all going to take a breath and say a word. And every time you say individual, 
look at what you're reminding everybody every time you say it, right? I love that about language. So it's up to you. Uh, great. Then we also have this weird word of staff. I'd love to know your opinion of staff. How do you like the word staff? And what people have pointed out is it kind of pigeonholes us into a role instead of a person. There we are again. And it doesn't show relationship. Uh, whereas ideally we want to see each other as equals, you know, whether you work there or live there. So sometimes we sort of have the feeling staff, I hate to say versus residents, that sounds terrible, but in the institutional model, that's sometimes kind of what we had or kind of what we portrayed. So be aware, is that in your culture, staff versus residents? Or, you know, are we all people equal and some of us live here and some of us work here? I tend to use the word team member. I believe the, the words have more value. You, you are a member of the team, right? And you're, it implies equal, you're a team member. I think it has more power than the word staff. And then you've maybe heard the term care partner that actually comes to us from the Eden alternative. They actually refer to everyone as a care partner. So they might refer to the elder care partner, the older person, the person who lives there. They're a partner in their own care, the family care partner and the employee care partner. And you have to give them credit. It's the same idea that we're all equal. If you wanna play with that and try it, please do. I've also heard co communities focus on, on you know, trying to find the right word. It might be colleagues, it might be associates and signature health actually refers to employees as stakeholders. And at first it's kind of weird and you learn that's their language, but notice what they're trying to do with that word. It says so much more than staff, see? It's so great. And then if we're trying to create home for people, true home, we also don't usually have staff in our home, although I really wish I did. Anybody else? I want a maid. How about you? And back to patient, remember patient-centered care, something's missing when that's all we keep saying. I kind of think, and I've heard people say it, that when we just keep saying patient, 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 we're actually missing the person. And so remember, the word patient tends to mean something is done to you. You're in a passive position. And we wanna change that. I, I believe we need person-centered language in every, in every um, scenario. And so if you kind of come from the hospital setting, maybe that's something you could get people to think about as well. So here's some more word association, everybody. Okay, what comes to your mind when I say elderly? <laughs> Did you know? Uh, let's see now, I ruined it, uh, spoiler alert. Let's say, what comes to mind when you hear, ready? Another word, elderly. What jumped in your mind? Just curious, it's not right or wrong. What landed in your mind? Elderly. Uh, are you all still there, I hope? Yep, here we go, here comes some chat. Okay, thank you, Eileen, old. Thank you, Brenda, wrinkled. <laughs> Pam, just plain old. <laughs> Isn't this fun? I love it, frail. Okay, can't do as much. Thanks, everyone. Remember, there's no right or wrong. I'm not looking for the right answer. It's just a weird phenomenon, everyone, that the word elderly, get this, has itself become ageist because typically, maybe not always, maybe not all of you, but typically we think of negative things. And that just happened. Here's geriatric and here's the word aged again. Uh, so in, in your case, just as a little litmus test, every word tended to be negative. It does in my mind as well, sadly. But guess what? Sometimes in some cultures, positive words come up like like those words earlier, sage, an older person who's wise sometimes is referred to as a sage, right? Or wise, right? Or I, I do sometimes use the word elder in a certain context. If someone is older than me and I'm sort of trying to honor that, I might say who is my elder, you know? Uh, so just sometimes there are positive words about aging, but not very often. 
And by the way, if we are going to represent aging because we work in the field, I'm calling myself out, everyone. We have to start talking more positively about aging. We do. Because if we don't, who's going to, you see? And so you don't have a senior moment. No, you just didn't remember. Just like when you were seven and you didn't remember. And we didn't call it a seven-year-old moment, right? Uh, we got to be kind to ourselves and, and just try not to speak so negative about aging. It's hard, actually. And so why would we make it harder? And maybe we need to help each other see the positive in it and just help each other in it because it's, it's the way it was designed, right? And so here's a funny thing, too. The word senior, some people like it. If you like it, that's great. I have a friend who loves it. She loved being a senior in high school and a senior in college. <laughs> But most of the majority of people say, hey, give me the discount, but don't you dare call me a senior, right? And then I learned from a doctor of gerontology at Denver University, he just suggested considering the term older adult. So you don't have to use elderly, you don't have to use senior. I, t I tend to do that myself. I learned it from him many years ago. Um, and then again, you could, you know, it depends on the context. Do you really need to talk about the older people? Or are you talking about the people who live at, you know, St. John's Living Center, you know, if it's important, indicate it. And if it's not, we, we don't need to worry about it, right? Because people of all ages now live in all sorts of settings. Um, isn't that interesting? We all probably got into this because we love older people, but notice it's not just older people. And then we have this weird way, hopefully you don't do this anymore, but sometimes it comes up that someone suffers with dementia. And so in the culture change movement, they've really pushed it over to this is someone who lives with dementia, or you could refer to the people living with dementia. And then it could be even better, Dr. Al Power is a leader in, um, in training us on how to look at dementia. And he explains it, oh, I love this. He says, if you or I, God forbid, lost a leg, we would learn how to live life without that leg. We would, we would negotiate through life differently now because we don't have that leg, but we would still live our life even without that leg. And so he tries to teach us this person is living their life differently now with the dementia. They're experiencing life differently. Maybe it's not always negative. We don't know. We're not living it. It looks negative. It seems negative to us. And then I'll just put in a plug for this. If you know how to do validation, the validation method, you can really help people living in the confusion and the disorientation and the high emotion sometimes that comes with dementia. And I love training people on that. So here's a moving on to another example about language. We also have something called pejorative language that is used quite often in this field. And notice, notice how this sounds. Oh, we let our residents sleep in or, oh, we, we allow them to have a pet. <laughs> we permit them to have one plant per room. Aren't we great? And there's a problem. And those words, let and allow and permit, it's called pejorative. Who can hear it? What's the matter still with that kind of language? There's, there's like this hovering something that still isn't quite right. Who can name it? Oh, we let our residents sleep in. Oh, we allow them to sleep in. Oh, we permit them to sleep until they wake up. Can you tell what it is, everybody? What is, what is, can you put words to it? What's happening when we say things like, oh, we let them and we allow them. And what other people have identified is there's like this uh, misnomer, right? Yes, that we are in control and they have no power. And to be honest, it sort of doesn't even exist. Isn't that weird? <laughs> okay, it does and it doesn't. You guys have a lot of power over people because you represent the nursing home, right? And the care and the schedule. So in a way, you do have that power. But in another way, you don't. And here's why. As adults, you don't let me do anything and I don't let you do anything. And that's, if we could get there, that you are caring for fellow adults and you don't make fellow adults do things and you don't let fellow adults do things, right? So we support, like we support natural awakening and we honor sleep 
and we encourage sleep. And another person said, treating as not giving someone power. That's right. So be aware of that, everybody. Pejorative language could be a focus in your community to be careful about that as well. How about this, everyone? Ready? How many of you were admitted to the house you live in? Anybody? Okay. How many of you were discharged from the last house you lived in? And you're willing to admit it. Isn't that funny? I think it's funny. And, you know, I... I just can't say it anymore. So in the movement, many homes that have worked on language do not talk about admission and discharge anymore. They talk about people moving in and moving out. And yes, we know that some people that you serve do not come to live there and they don't want to be called residents. I would not want to be called a resident if I was there for rehab, but check this out. Even though some people come for a short time, it is still home to the people who live there. So it is home. It is a home. And um, if you think about your home, do people come and go? Do sometimes people come to your house and your home and stay there for a short while? And I'm guessing yes. <laughs> oh boy. Even during a pandemic and certainly before and after. And what do you call those people when they come to your home and stay for a short while? And I'll watch for someone to add that. Here's another crazy one. Ready? Oh, let, let's wait. So instead of admission coordinator, I've seen people switch it to move in coordinator. And again, I realize it still may not be the right one. It's kind of in the right direction. But since not everyone moves in, I've seen that title also transition over to um, community liaison. And you don't have to use any of that. But I realize that's probably a pretty good description of what that person does in that role. Not everyone moves in. You're in. You're a liaison to a lot of community uh, resources, etc. And so, uh, let's see. What was my question now to you all? I forgot. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> someone rescue me. Thank you. Pam brought up visitor. Let's see. Yes, if someone comes to your home. And the other one I was looking for was guest, everyone. So you have guests in your home. And so some people are referring to rehab guests. I think that's beautiful, personally. And it takes so much of the clinical out. Um, and it, it honors the fact that it is other people's home. Uh, and uh, that's what we're doing with admission and discharge. And then look at this. What do you really place? In real life, what gets placed? If you think of that word... And what gets put? What are we doing if we're placing something or putting something? And thank you, uh, stuff. That's right, Eileen, thank you. And isn't it sad that somehow we, we came to, we had to place mom in a nursing home, had to put mom in a nursing home. So I'd encourage you all, uh, when you, when you, when you kind of be bold and, and bring up language in a kind way, what I've learned is people in the wider community, they end up really appreciating it. They'll say things like, like my neighbor would say, Carmen, I never thought about that. You're right. I don't want to say I put my mom there, you know? And so we just have to kind of be gutsy and kind, right? <laughs> and take a deep breath because it takes a while to explain it. And then here's some funny ones. This is a true story, everyone. There's a story where a person living in the nursing home overheard some of the people who work in the nursing home talking about another person <laughs> who lives there that she eloped. And this one, this gentleman said, hey, I didn't even know she was dating. And I think that is so great because it proves everyone that we use language that is unclear, you know, and, and I think we sometimes think, hey, you know, I'm, I know what I'm doing. They call that elope. But in reality, some people don't know what elope means in the healthcare setting. So why not use words that everyone understands completely? I mean, what if there's an emergency, right? And you want people to know exactly what you're talking about. And then worse than that, I've heard people say, oh, they escaped. And what does that say about our institutional language, right? And so I would challenge you to just try to just say the real deal that someone left the building or someone left without us knowing it you know, that is more normal language. And then how about this one, everyone? Who can tell me what really expires in real life? <laughs> in your real life, 
what what do we talk about that expires much different than in a nursing home so yes thanks carrie ann milk expires yogurt expires cheese expires and i've learned from older people they don't have any problems talking about someone died it, it feels like it maybe was our problem and you know even if a nurse has to use that word i guess we we all don't have to right so normal language we're, we're trying to get rid of department everyone it's it's institutional you don't have it in your home and i believe the word team says what we mean in a much better way let's there's the dining team we're also not saying dietary anymore it's old it's institutional it's not normal you don't have a dietary department in your house at least we don't say that we do <laughs> some people joke well that's me i cook right so in, and then we're moving to dining much more than dietary if you have a chef, you know, it's my understanding that if you have a true chef, you could be culinary services. And maybe people in that arena know of even other words that we're not using that we could. And oh, what fun, right? It's so much better. And then this is interesting. If I say the word industry, what do you think of real quick? Another word association, industry, what tends to come to your mind first? Um, I, I don't think it's long-term care, to be honest. And so I myself have chosen not to refer to what we do as a, in, as a industry, because typically the term industry is often thought of as, you know, uh, manufacturing. And I see a refinery in my head in downtown, you know, middle of Denver, if anyone else can see that. Um, and notice that what we do is better than an industry so maybe we work in the long-term care field or the long-term care profession is is what i've found and then also we have the word home like and what people have pointed out is do you really want home like or would you rather have home and so it's just an idea like if you need to use home like for a while fine but but maybe make home the true goal to help people feel at home that this is their home and, and all you can do to create true home for people. There's a lot more that can be said about that, but as far as language goes, we'll leave it at that. How many of you have renamed the term unit? You don't use unit anymore. And then even older than unit would be wing or station or hall. And if you're using them, I just wanna really encourage you to think about not. And to be honest, the term that most most people have um, moved over to is neighborhood. And it's probably a fair word. It's certainly a better word. People in our, in our real lives don't live in units, right? That really is a word of a hospital. And so uh, unless you represent like your greenhouses in Sheridan, they live in a house, right? But if you're in the older style model, you could start to refer to neighborhoods and then of course, rather than neighborhood one, two, three, and four, <laughs> it's been very fun for the communities to decide what to name their neighborhood. So make sure residents are involved in that for sure. And, and certainly anyone else you want involved if staff and families too, but we don't live there, they do. And then, you know, do you have a lobby in your house? Do you have a common area in your house? The word common area I've learned actually comes from the blueprints, you know, Architects have to point out where public areas are and they call them common areas, but we don't have to call it that. So typically the term living room tends to, tends to work and maybe there's others, which is fine. You, you decide. Uh, oddly enough in this, in this work, we also, even before the pandemic, you know, have you heard it? We refer to um, our CNAs often as frontline workers. And what smarter people than me have pointed out is that when we say frontline, there's a word association. What is it, everyone? When I say frontline, what comes to mind? Get ready, everybody. I need you. Frontline. War. Thank you, Eileen. So it makes you wonder. Um, I'm kind of weird about this stuff. So my thought is, wow, maybe subconsciously what we tell people is, you know, you're in a battle now. Beware. And it almost feels like, it's like this, you go into the room first, and if you come out, then I will join you. You know, like we, we set it up 
to feel warlike, to feel enemies, to be us versus them. Oof, we don't need to do that, everyone. So what do we really mean? I think we really mean direct caregivers or caregivers or CNAs. Maybe sometimes we need, mean the nurses. You could consider the language of hands-on team members. But again, just be more descriptive. Who are you talking about? Uh, if you find that you use that term at all. And then here's another funny one. How many of us say, oh, I'm so tired. I had to work the floor last night. Has anyone said it? And what did you mean? And so if you think about people that don't work in this field, and we talk about having to work the floor, <laughs> you know, one, let's see, mopping comes to my mind, but one time in a large session, a large workshop, like 800 people in California, some guy in the middle of the California group said, hey, that's not what I thought of, wink, wink. So work the floor could mean lots of things. And you want, again, to say what you mean. So maybe you mean you assisted residents. To be honest, if the nurse worked the floor, I don't think she assisted residents. She probably passed meds, right? <laughs> so the idea is simply to, again, be more descriptive. How many of you are trying to get rid of the, um, what some of us call the F word? <laughs> now we only use that to, to make a point. If it's in your personality to do that, great. No pressure though, if you don't love it. And so the point is, let's all think about the word facility, okay? What is a facility? Think of your dentist's office, that's a facility. Think of a school, that's a facility. Have you ever seen people's t-shirts? Facilities management, right? The word facility basically means building. And you know what? It doesn't usually mean house or home. And, it, and I think a school is a great example. A school is a facility because nobody lives there. And that really drives me. I can't use that word. It's not a normal word where people live and we can easily replace it. So sometimes the word home might fit and sometimes the term community might fit and sometimes the, the title of your place. Here at Polaris, you know, what do you think of living here at Polaris, right? Um, those are some options for you. And then it gets worse, you know, I am the administrator of a 120 bed facility. <laughs> and I just want to say, if you don't know this work, what is that? What might that mean to somebody? Bed, beds, do you, what, what do you mean beds, you know? And who can tell me where that comes from? There's a reason we always refer to beds. And I'd love to know if you can think of where it comes from, and then I'll tell you. And so just try to avoid it would be the answer. If you really need a title, uh, it, it's going to sound different. When you change language, everyone, it's awkward. So you could say, I'm the administrator of a 120-person home. Those are exact um, replacements if you want. Or you could say it differently. I'm the administrator of this nursing home where... Uh, 120 people could live and today 110 live, you know, you can even start to not use those words census and occupancy. Uh, and really when we say beds, here's what makes me sad. We're, we're actually dismissing the people who live there and you know where it comes from the license. I'm, I can't wait for maybe the first state to stop referring to beds and maybe it could be Wyoming. You know, we, we have access to your state survey agency, I'm making a note, you know, maybe we could challenge them to be the first state to stop referring to beds and maybe instead refer to the people who live there. Isn't that something? And then if you actually mean a bedroom, then say bedroom, you know, and oftentimes there's two beds in one bedroom, right? And so again, it kind of reveals, why don't we say what we mean? So now I'm gonna to jump to the word therapy and share two quotes with you. Look at the word therapy, for instance. Why does everything have to be therapy once you live in a nursing home? If I like to paint before I moved into the nursing home and I paint now that I'm here, why is my hobby now called art therapy? I mean, no insult, no insult, everybody, to the wonderful folks who call themselves therapists and their work, their special training or their skills. In fact, I'm a massage therapist myself, but in this context, therapy becomes a separating word. Here's another, another comment about therapy. Putting the label therapy on normal activity has become a tradition in nursing homes and other healthcare settings in order to establish the professionalism of those who do it. This is a case of scientism, 
a language trend toward elevating status of an action by appropriating medical terminology. Wow, people do things that are therapeutic all the time without therapists because we feel simply better when we do them. So when you go for a walk, for example, why don't we say, oh, I gotta go get some physical therapy? We don't, we just say, I gotta go take a walk or I gotta get some exercise, right? So doing things we enjoy should not take on a stigma of having something wrong with us and that's why we do it. So I would encourage you everyone, it, I feel like it's been the norm to say, oh, we have pet therapy. You don't have to call it that. I wouldn't. It medicalizes real life. People just enjoy animals usually. Art therapy, no offense, but it doesn't have to be called that. Call it what it is. Are you water painting today? Or are you oil painting today? Or are you doing something else today, right? And then even the term therapeutic activities, I've always wondered, who has the right to say that? Who gets to say that, see? And, and I believe in that field, we felt pressure to become a little more clinical, see? And so we called them therapeutic activities. And then if you just keep thinking of normal language, I don't hear a lot of people talk about their leisure. I don't hear a lot of people talk about, I'm gonna go do this for my recreation. Um, I don't hear people refer to their activity programming or what activities, you know, think about if I said, hey, Fred, what activities are you doing on the weekend? You know, sounds kind of weird. And so some of you have changed to life engagement, life enrichment, you know, th those changes took place a long time ago. And I think they make the point. Some communities moved away from activities a long time ago. Um, we're, we're really seeing a lot of more focus on engagement. I don't know if you know this uh, nationwide, instead of activities, we're talking about engagement. We're starting to see titles of engagement um, coordinator and then another great title that a lot of not-for-profits have used through a lot of leading age homes use community life, which is quite beautiful because now you're the community life coordinator. They purposely don't use director and lots of you are directors. You wouldn't have to be. The term director is a little, a little forceful. What does it kind of sound like? And do you really direct people or do you coordinate? So a lot of, a lot of words have moved over to coordinator community life coordinator, community calendar instead of the activity calendar, and you would be the community life team. And I realize I'm running out of time. Look at that, imagine that. And so I have some beautiful quotes here for you that real life is not found in programs. Real life is in the give and take of everyday life. Don't confuse programs with real life. And so another big message is to help people live real life and not worry about so many programs. We're moving away from groups, moving away from activity programming, and we're just moving towards more individualized engagement by myself, and then engagement in real life, not so many contrived groups. This is a picture of like a perfect care plan, everyone. There's all your care, ta-da, what's missing? Life. What if care was minimal and it supported how the person wants to live? And then let me show you with long-term care and clinical care and person-centered care, what's missing everybody? Life. Look at this. It would be nice if when one moves into a nursing home, they asked you how you want to live instead of all that medical stuff. We should start quoting her. And now look at this, everyone. We call it independent what? Independent living. Assisted what? Assisted living. And then you need more care, care. And what do you get? Long-term care. Get ready, this was profound the first time I heard it. Where did the living go? That's a tragedy, everyone. I think that's part of our problem. So get back to talking about life and living, uh, resident directed living, whatever you call it, uh, just talk about life and living the most. And notice there's power in our ageist language and there's power in our normal language. And one of the premise of our movement is rampant normalcy. So we can bring that to language. And I'd love for you to think about what do you say about aging? Is, is what you say ageist? We don't have to do that. And here's a beautiful quote uh, to talk about each of us working on our own journey of aging and new capacities for growth and giving. And like I said, new, new language is awkward. Be aware of that. It won't quite feel right at first, but if you push through it, you'll create a new norm. And then, um, uh, again, you can shape a new culture. Here's the resource. I also have a handout back to back. If you want it, email me. Here's some more language resources. 
You also, everybody, have a superpower. I love calling it a superpower. You have the superpower to um, fight against the institutional language, institution speak, and even ageism. And last but not least, um, I kind of mentioned this, but this is a wonderful quote. Just keep trying to move in this direction from institution to home-like, and then even better to home. Move that needle closer to home. I just love that. And then uh, we are going to hear from one of your own. Um, here's the five centers, the five uh, homes, nursing homes. In, in, I don't like center, by the way. I don't think people live in centers, if you think about that. But uh, I don't mean that judgmentally. But if you just look at words, do pe real people live in centers? And so here's the five nursing homes that are in the project. And here's what they're up to. And by the way, we'll need five more for year two. And these are always recorded if you want to share them with everyone, anyone. And we have two big goals for Wyoming, everyone, that everyone who works in a nursing home actually receives some training about culture change. So please pass on these links. And number two, our big goal is that all people who live in a Wyoming nursing home sleep until they wake up. If you want to join our coalition, please let me know. Uh, please consider doing a word of the week or a word of the month. And I'd like to open up right now for Pam. I'm going to say you can unmute yourself, Pam. And I'd love for you to hear what Pam has led her community in doing regarding language. Thank you, Pam. Well, we decided that we wanted to really work on language. Um, and so we thought that would be something fun to do to increase the awareness of everyone. So we had these little pins made by one of our individuals there in mm -hmm. our in our care center. And uh, every one of our employees was given one. And uh, and what we picked out several words to work on. We worked on the word facility to use home or community, not staff to use team team members or care partners. Uh, instead of the commons, we would call it the living room or TV room and, and toileting, assisting to the bathroom were the ones that we picked. Ooh. And then if you caught anyone saying one of those words, you got to you got to uh, get one of their pens. They had to fork it over. And so it really has helped us to become more aware of our speech. Oh my God. Right. Pam. And look at look at this name, everyone. Pam Sprecher. I happen to speak German and German means to, or Sprecher means speaker and to speak. And isn't this just so cool that Pam thought of this idea and they are doing it. That is one of their pins. And if you say one of the words that everyone's being asked not to, <laughs> you have to give up the whole pin. Uh, Pam, I thought maybe it would be like a bead at a time, but it's a whole pin. <laughs> they right? have three to start with and they can lose all three of them if they, <laughs> and then yep. they try to get them back. Okay, now Pam, I'm curious, as you add more words, you know, have you thought about this yet? How you're gonna handle, what words are we working on now? And then maybe there's other words later. Has that come up yet? Yes, we're, we just started with uh, four to begin with and I've gotten some great ideas from today's training uh, to add for next month. Great, <laughs> so exciting. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much. And I'll ask here in the chat box if anyone has questions for Pam while she's on the line. And I do believe that should be most of it, everyone. Um, just some, does anyone have questions or other words that are coming to your mind? Uh, please put in the chat box and I can unmute you too. Uh, so to close while I'm watching the chat box, um, just some takeaways perhaps to be cognizant of institution speak or institutional language, be proactive to, I would say, talk about it. The, the hard part about this is to not look like you're always correcting someone. That's the position I find myself in. So please forgive me. I didn't mean to correct anyone listening. That part is hard. So that's why I really respect what you've done, Pam, because you, you've you given um, a, a system of really like a reward system, but in the reverse, you don't want to lose your pin. Isn't that brilliant? And so instead of calling people out, shame on you, you know, Oh, shucks, you lost a pin and that's it. You all agreed to it. It's, it's really creative. Um, so find your way in your community, everyone. Agree to talk about it. Maybe agree to bring it up if someone used it. Um, here's a fun idea I have heard. One time someone told me the way they handled it was they just had fun with it. And here's what they meant. They might go like this. Hey, Pam, you did not just hear Brenda say facility, did you? <laughs> you know, And it, that's meant to be cute and fun and 
funny. And I think that might be another great way to do it. Um, I know of a group that did a word of the week. So someone initiated an email and said, hey, everyone, let's think about the word discharge this week. What do you think about it? What comes to mind? What's the definition? Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it good? Is it bad? What could be better? And you all could do that. Um, a word of the month, a word of the week. We're kind of doing that as the coalition as well. Uh, then again, just keep talking about it. What do we want to change it to? Um, you, <laughs> I just thought of this when I typed it, get the word out. And notice how that itself could be a play on words, get the word out. <laughs> so if you want to take that like a theme, I think that's funny. And then again, last but not least, whatever we all do, let's focus more about life and living. And I'd love to challenge you to think about how often you say the word care, it comes out of your lips. And maybe you could start making yourself rephrase it. And by the way, a leader of language calls themselves on it and they say it out loud. That will help your team to learn. So if you say, oops, I said it again, resident, I'm trying to say neighbor, you guys help me. Okay, so one of our neighbors brought this up today, Mrs. So-and-so, you know, or, oh shoot, I just said uh, clinical care again. Um, well, guys, um, even though the clinical care side of life is important. Let's not forget how this is affecting Mrs. Smith's life. Let's think about what her life looks like. You know, care is part of life. So um, it also, uh, let, let me just look at this. Let's emphasize life more than care and choose words that reflect life and living and normalcy. And, that and we're not taking away at all from clinical care. It's just that clinical care has taken over and we have to remember to talk about the life that people are living, even with the good clinical care that you're giving. So with, without seeing any uh, comments or questions, we'll close. Thank you so much for joining me today. Bye now.